Hello and welcome to the British Chamber of Commerce in Macau podcast. This week we have invited Carlos Alvarez, Chief Executive Officer of Macau Bank BNU, to give his insights into the ever-relevant topic of diversification. I hope you listen with interest to Carlos's thoughts on the diversification of Macau's economy and his message that diversification means risk mitigation. Thank you. I'm going to show you some data um, that you already know. Um, this slide shows us that, unfortunately, um, world economy is not going to grow as we expected maybe one year ago. And unfortunately, and I'm, I'm, I, I didn't change this slide because I didn't know if we would have it before or after lunch, but the projections are worse than this. So when we are talking about the world output instead of less 3%, the new expectations is less, almost 5%. When you're talking about the advanced economies, instead of less 6.1, it's less 8. United States, 8% instead of 5.9. Euro area, less 10%. Emerging markets, instead of less one, less three. And in the end, and it's there, China. I think it's one of the few countries that is going to present a growing. And instead of 1.2, it's going to be 1%. If we look to the growth in the past years, um, we can see that um, economic growth and the contribution by region. I'm a little bit colorblind, but I think China is brown and uh, Asia, excluding China, is gray. gray. So the, the contribution done by this region is very high. And maybe that's also because China is still growing this year because it's a, a fast train, high-speed train that's not easy to, to be stopped. When we look to Macau, so last year we saw that the GDP growth was negative, 4.7. At the beginning of the year and on the right side of the slide, we could see that we could go down 30% almost. But unfortunately, what you see for the last forecast, it's maybe we are going to reach a negative uh, growth of almost 70%. And there are some, some investment houses that say that it can be even higher. Unfortunately, in 2021, we are going to see um, income, the GDP growing. Today morning, I saw a, a Morgan Stanley study that says that the um, casinos business maybe can break even on the third case. So that's a good news. I expect that they have a lot of information, more than me, that can show us, that can show this. When we are looking to the components of the, the structure of the GDP of Macau, we can see here that the, the exports of mainly services, so this is the casino business, 80, account for 83%. Then we have the imports related with the exports. So the exports, the liquid exports, it's more or less 50%. And this is the weight of the gaming business, the liquid weight of the gaming business on the Macau economy. Public administration, more or less 10%. Real estate activities, more or less 10%. Wholesale and retail trade, 6 Banking services, of course, or more or less 5%. Then we have other activities with 20 This explains the, um, the GDP. And here on this side, we can see that the private consum consumption, 25 Government, 10 
fixed investment almost 14, and then the liquid exports 50. For these figures, uh, imagine United States. Do you know what's the percentage in the United States for private consumption? Anyone wants to say uh, a number? 70% in the United States. In Germany, 53. In government consumption, United States, 17. Germany, 20. Fixed investment, United States, 18. Germany, 20. And then liquid exports, United States is negative 5. Germany is positive 7. So we can see that Macau economy, it's very linked to the gaming business, this is good, this is bad. Depends on the perspective that we can look at it. When gambling business is going up, everybody forgets diversification. When the gambling business is going down, a lot of people start thinking on this. Um, the, um, looking only to the goods, uh, and it's not a big amount, so foods and beverage, food and beverage, garments, full, uh, beauty, cosmetic products are the mainly main imports and they came mainly from China and European Union and the main exports of goods are machines, watches, textile garments, diamonds and I, I suppose that most part of them are not produced in Macau and they go mainly to Hong Kong and, and maybe they are export after they go to, to Hong Kong and China. Looking to the unemployment rates, we still have a very good position uh, in Macau. It's 2.3, I think, at this moment. Of course, we have the issue related with the blue card, so this doesn't count here for the statistics because people go back to the countries. But Macau has um, a strong position, no debt, uh, a very important fund of 60 billion US dollars. So Macau is doing, the government is doing what he can and what he should do to protect the individuals, to protect the small companies. And we see by these figures and we are not expecting a, a very strong growth on unemployment. Interest rates are low, so that we can help to fool the economy and the gross gaming revenue, and you all know. So in January, we still had 22 billion, but after that, the figures are very low. And then June and July, unfortunately, they don't seem to be very big. Fortunately, we saw this morning the study of Morgan Stanley that shows that maybe the casino business can break even on the K3. Then we can see that the main infrastructure and projects in development, we see the LRT, we see also the Macau Airport ex extension, and we see here the, the Macau new landfills. Uh, so I think something is going to happen related with this uh, situation mainly here in A because a lot of projects are already being developed. And we see also here that it's growing, something is growing here. The Macau Airport extension is going to happen. And on the private side and on the casino sides we have the Galaxy Macau, the Phase 3 and 4, the SGM that is going to open in the near future, Studio City, Phase 2, Sunshine at the Londoner, when we see all, all this happening in Macau. And we are also inching the new area development that we can see on a daily basis that it's happening on the other side of the river. Hengxin has three times the, the square kilometers that Macau has, so it has more or less 100 kilo, kilo, square kilometers. And it's a completely different uh, business oriented, so no gaming business, and uh, a lot of things are happening in Hangxing. We have already there a branch, and other banks have also branches there. 
and we can see that we have the, the Chimlong International Ocean Tourist Resort. I never went there, but I have to go because a lot of people tell me that it, it's worthwhile. Hengxin campus of the University of Macau, and everybody knows it. It's a marvelous campus. Uh, Xi Zimen Central Business District, traditional Chinese medicine, Chinese and technology industrial park, and Yat Marina and Yat Industry Demonstration Base. And we have also a lot of projects in development, the Yangshin Financial Island, the Yangshin Port Transport Hub, the Yangshin Legend Pondo Square, the Guangdong Macau Corporation Industrial Park, and we have also, and it was uh, recently bought by the Macau government, we have uh, a, la a land, Macau bought a land there, and there's a Macau company that is going to build 4,000 about apartments there for Macau citizens. So something big is happening here in, in Hengxi. This slide, I'm not going to lose a lot of time with it because we, you all know it. It's a great Bay Area diversification project. Um, but this one, maybe we can lose some, some minutes with that. So, the Great Bay Area is 56,000 kilometers, square kilometers, a 70 million population, 1.4 trillion US dollars GDP. How do we compare this? So this represents more or less 7% of U United States GDP, 40% of the GDP of Germany, 70% of the GDP of Italy. It's something huge. And if we compare some countries that have a similar square kilometers like Netherlands, Denmark, Ireland, Scotland, we see that the population compared with the 70 million, it's very low. And the GDP, if we look to Denmark, Ireland, Scotland, Austria, it's five times lower than the GDP of the, um, the Great Bay, Great Bay area. So it's um, something that uh, it's very important for the development of Macau. And also, if we look to the future, what the expectations is that in 10 years, this Great Bay Area reaches 4.2 trillion US dollars of GDP. So it's a lot of things are happening on this, on this um, Great Bay Area. And Macau has to be on it. Uh, you, you all saw this also, so I'm not going to lose a lot of time with it. So what we expect from Macau, from Hong Kong, from Shenzhen, from Guangzhou, that are the, the most important cities on the, the, the 11 of the Great Bay Area. And I'm going to stop here before I, I, I show the next slide. So, what we have until now, it's something that you already know. And after this slide, I'm going to try to, to talk about something that maybe it's different from what you, you are hearing about the diversification. So we have Macau, strongly dependent from the gaming business. We are seeing it now, today. Uh, then we have Hengxin. Something is happening in Hengxin Island. And Macau is looking to that. The Macau government is looking to that. Buying land, building uh, 4,000 units. and the speech of the, the CE can tell us that maybe there is something more than only uh, plots for individuals to buy. Maybe there is something bigger uh, that can happen in the new, fu new future. And then we have the Great Bay Area. So 70 million people, uh, 1.4 trillion USD dollars of GDP, and the comparison with the other countries, it's Amazing, and what can happen here, it's, it's very interesting. So, my idea about the diversification of the Macau is mainly related with the fact that, ah, and something that I don't have a slide. I saw some statistics, statistics this month that show us that Macau people had, has, outside, outside Macau, 100 billion US dollars in capital markets. So Macau people has more or less 100 billion US dollars in Macau, 
on the banking system, and they have also 100 billion uh, US dollars outside Macau invested in capital markets. Let's suppose that half of this belongs to the government. I told you before that that investment, that fund of 60 billion US dollars, let's suppose that we are talking about 50. So the other 50 billion belongs to Macau people outside Macau and invested in capital markets. Let's say that we have people with money. There's a political, um, how can I say, desire or an environment that tells us that we should do something more. So we have money. We have uh, the will. What do we don't have? Maybe we don't have land. But there's happening, Hengshin is happening and uh, happening and Great Bay Area is happening. And maybe we don't have the skills. We don't have uh, talent people. So what we have to do? We have to get this. How can we do it? Maybe with joint ventures. And what kind of joint ventures? So let's see what we what I am thinking about. So first of all, doing business in Hengshin or Zuhai. So I'm going to talk about doing business in China, but I'm going to focus in the Great Bay Area. Something amazing is happening because two years ago in 2018, and this is, um, this is not a Chinese database. This is a World Bank database. So this was not built by China. This was built by an independent uh, entity. And in 2018, uh, China was ranked in 78 for doing business in China. Last, 2019, 46. And it's amazing, 2020, 31st. So doing business in China, I hear a lot of people telling me it's so difficult to do business in China. And then I look to this ranking, wow, it should be also difficult to do business in France or in Switzerland or in Portugal. And I know very well what's happening in Portugal with the bureaucracy, a lot of rules, no capital. And in Netherlands, so when we look to this, of course, I see New Zealand, Singapore, Hong Kong, Denmark, Korea. Well, great, United States, they are ranked in the first till 10. But then I see China, 31st. And it came in three years from the 78. So it's something that we have to think. Maybe if we don't have land, we have to do something in Hengxin or in Zhuhai or in one of the cities uh, close by. And it's, I'm, I'm going to show you that already out foreign companies are doing this. Um, how to succeed in China? I, I, we took some examples that we are going to show and we did a summary of things that we think that were done by the companies that are succeeding in China. Now, knowledge of the Chinese market and business environment to define a well-suited strategy for the company. China is not an easy market, so we have to fit on it. We have to understand Chinese culture. We have to do things based on the fact that we are doing business in China. And it must be not very different from doing business in Australia or New Zealand or Brazil. All the countries have special features. Developing a good relationship with regulators and government officials, this is crucial. We have to talk with people that know better than us what's happening on their countries. Effectively protecting the brand in China, this is very important and I see what's happening with, also with BNU, sometimes I have to, to, do, uh, to work with lawyers about this. Investing and planning for the long term. Don't expect to make money on the first or second year. You have to think on a uh, long term basis. Flexibility and quickly adaptation to market changes. There are a lot of companies that did this to survive and to be and to succeed. Promotion of close and good relationship with China's business partners, customers and employees. And consistent presence in China and ability to in innovate. Let's see. These are not the companies that I'm looking for, but these are cases of success. So, 2020 among the largest 250 global companies by market capitalization have already entered in China until 2019. 
So they are already in China doing business, making money. And what can we see? Some examples. Um, Apple, so it accounts for 25% of the turnover. Chinese consumers have already demonstrated their devotion to purchasing only the best. We have market for Apple. Starbucks, they pay high, higher wages than competitors, extending employee ownerships, benefits to its workers. IKEA, the company became part of a Chinese culture. Visiting IKEA is like visiting a theme park. Uh, LinkedIn, they are doing business in China. And other companies like LinkedIn are doing business also in China. But, but the local team runs LinkedIn in a Chinese way. Furthermore, they decide to collaborate heavily with local players. I cannot spell Bootsock, Bootsock Dutch. Bootsock is a company focused on providing care to people at home. One of China's major concerns for the future. Nike, 90% market share in China. It's amazing. Evernote. Online note taking ape Evernote, they changed the name so that it could be easily pronounced. Tesla, environmental friend products, even if they are expensive, people like good cars. Aero Bakery, the success of it is the full adaptation to the Chinese market. So we can see that a lot of companies are already in China doing business, making money. Of course, a lot of difficulties, but they must have a lot of difficulties also in other countries. And you saw it before. Doing business in China, it's difficult, but they are already ranked in 31st. So, now let's look to the, what I expect that can be the solution for Macau diversification. So, joint ventures, not with a big multinational uh, companies because they can go directly to Beijing or directly to Shanghai. They don't need to come to Macau. But let's look at a Portuguese example. I could build something very similar for a Brazilian case or for a Dutch case or for a Brit case. So I'm going to talk, speak about Portugal because I know all these companies behind. But there is someone here in Macau that knows also the same for their parent companies. Cork. It's a fam familiar, it's a, a family-owned company. They are used to sell to many, many countries. They compete with the best. And they are doing business already in China, but not in the Great Bay Area. Maybe they could have a partnership with Macau entrepreneur to do business in Hengxin or in Zhuhai or in, or in the Great Bay Area city. Automobile, textile, and after this I'm going to, to tell you why the sectors, but let me tell you. Two companies in Portugal, they, they, are, they are selling to the tier one suppliers. In the end, the, the products that they are selling are leather, for, leather for the steering wheel, leather for the gearbox, so when we are driving a Porsche or an Audi or other German cars, Volkswagen, whatever, we are, uh, part of the car was built by, or the component is a Portuguese one. And also they could do this for a Chinese automobile maker using a uh, Macau uh, entrepreneur with a partnership to try to do business on the on mainland. Olive oil, one of the biggest companies in, in the world in, on olive oil business. They have factories in Portugal, Spain and the United States. They are used to compete with the best. This would be someone that could come also to joint venture with someone in Macau to do business on the, on the mainland. Tomato, it's also a family owned company. They have a lot of uh, land. They are producers, they have factories in Portugal, Spain and Chile and they could partner with someone here in Macau. Molds, these are companies that sell components to the automobile sector. There's a, a city in the north, Oliveira dos Mais, and there's a city in the center of the country, Leiria. There's very, uh, very good mold company. They sell to a lot of countries and they could do this also. 
pulp. This is a family owned, but this one is listed. The, they sell to more than 100 com companies. This company is used to compete with the best. So they can do, of course, business in China. And pharmaceutical, this one, you know already, it's Sauvignon. They are, they are very good on what they are doing. They were in the past already in China. Maybe they could go again. So this is an example of companies that are family owned. We are not talking about the big, big companies in the world, but we are talking about companies that are used to compete with the best, that could join efforts with Macau entrepreneurs, because Macau entrepreneurs, besides they have money, they, know, they have knowledge. They know much better what's happening in Hengxing. They know much better what's happening in Zhuhai. They know the government entities, they know people. So let's try to join our skills with, uh, of course, capital and, of course, with the knowledge of the markets. So this is the, the idea. Why these sectors? When we look to the main imports in China, um, I think we can think on replacing some imports that China does. Of course, not crude petroleum or integrated circuits, but maybe some components for cars. Uh, soybeans is one of the top, so maybe agriculture products, maybe other products that are related with those that companies that I talked before and that we can find also in, of course, in on other countries. Main exports from China to other countries, of course, we are not going to compete here because if they are exporting, they must be very, very good on what they are doing, but maybe we could um, have companies that could supply these companies on these on this sectors. So this is the, the main idea. Um, I would like to do some small advertisement of, about what BNU is. So we are integrated in a CGD group, it's a state-owned, we serve Portuguese-speaking countries, we are talking about 200 million people. We are connecting to economic areas of 700 million consumers. And in the South, the hemisphere, it's the first language on the, on the South hemisphere. BNU, we partner with a lot of uh, entities. We did protocols to do more business on the Portuguese-speaking countries with Bank of China, ICBC, IPEM. Uh, and, and we are going to sign in the near future uh, uh, something with an uh, insurance company to protect the, the, the exports of goods to the Portuguese-speaking countries. And uh, what can we do for helping the companies so try to do business and, exp and so that they can export safely, import with confidence, finance investment projects, advance export revenues, Advice on, on advice on the approach the market, financing the company's local branches, foreign exchange risk coverage, outline online monitoring of, of operations. And the last slide. How's the I'm okay? Yeah? Uh, the last slide, so uh, BNU note issuing bank since uh, 1902. Uh, part of the Portuguese banking group with the widest international platform. We are on all the Portuguese-speaking countries and we have the main operation on five of them. Um, doorway to China, strong commitment in development of relations between China and the Portuguese-speaking countries, of course. We have a team of specialists in all these countries where we are based. And uh, that's it, diverse banking offer with a wide array of financing products, as I said before. Thank you so much.